No. So tell me, what do you know about Jeffrey Chaucer? Do you have any idea about Jeffrey Chaucer and his poems? Yes, madam. I think yeah. Jeffrey Chaucer. Yeah. What do you know about him? Being a literature student, I mean, uh, most of you might have done your uh, graduation uh, in English literature. Hmm? So you might be having some idea about Jeffrey Chaucer. Yeah, Jeffrey Chaucer is the father of English literature. And also, uh... yeah, why he has been called as a father of English language? Tell me. Yeah, can you give me the answer for that? Why he has been called as a father of English language? Yeah, let's see. So Geoffrey Chaucer, who was born in thirteen forty three and died in fourteen hundred, was widely Mm, considered as the father of English language, and there are several reasons for considering him as a father of English language. You know, was the uh, very first reason is the one who found mm, the English dialect, okay, and left it as a language. Is the one who found the English during his time. There were uh, five major dialects in Eng England, mm, but he is the one uh, who found the e um, East Midland dialect mm, and left it as a language. Now, so he standardized English language. Hmm? So when you write an essay about Jeffrey Chaucer, include these points. Okay, point is very important. You needn't have to write what the poet has born about his personal life, nothing like that. Hmm? But whatever thing you include in the essay, that should be valid. Okay, so he's considered as the uh, greatest poet. Yeah, greatest poet of the Middle Age. Hmm? 13, uh, yeah, 1100 to 1500, hmm? Middle English period. I hope you know that. You have studied uh, history of English language, right? So, 11, a period from 1100 to 1500 AD is considered hmm, to be English, uh, I mean, Middle English period. He is regarded as a father of uh, English poetry because he standardized English hmm, until hmm, Till uh, 13th century, hmm, there were so many dialects in England. Hmm? Actually, uh, the dialect spoken by one person. Hmm? I mean, uh, I told you there are many dialects in uh, England. So, language spoken in one section hmm, uh, will not be... Uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to uh, understand by other person hmm, from uh, some other section. Got it? So, in Kerala, we have many districts, right? So the once uh, the language that is Malayalam that is used in Kasaragod, it uh, it will not be able to. Uh, I mean, a person from uh, Trivandrum, he will not be able to understand the language of Kasaragod. That was the condition of England then. Okay, even though lang language is English, it had many dialects. So he is the one who standardized English. He uh, he has chosen East Midland dialect and he used that in writing until Chaucer. And I mean until Chaucer. Mm? Uh, I mean, uh, other writers, they have used French and Latin. Mm? But he is the one who used English. Now, Edward Albert, mm? critic, the famous critic, called him the earliest of the great moderns and the morning star of Renaissance. Mm? See, this person has won several appellations. He has won several praises. Mm? He, he has been called the earliest star of, sorry, earliest of the great moderns and the morning star of renaissance and he is the first one to teach the art of versification versification means what poetry writing mm? is the one is one to set rules for poetry writing so these are the several reasons behind why he has been called as the father of english language mm -hmm. uh, so can you uh, i just want to confirm so uh, are you able to see this slide yes Hello? please Oh, okay, okay. Yes, okay. ma'am. So I'm changing the slide. Okay. Rhyme Royal, also known as Chaucerian Stanza, was introduced to English poetry, and he was the person who introduced Rhyme Royal. Rhyme Royal to English poetry. Okay. So let's see what is Rhyme Royal. Rhyme Royal Stanza consists of seven lines. Usually in iambic pentameter. What do you mean by iambic pentameter? Hmm? Class. What is iambic pentameter? That is a meter. Hmm? Uh, in Malayalam, uh, for non-literature student, hmm? students, uh, see, 
in malayalam we have vrittam and all isn't it lagu guru similarly in english we have stress and stress patterns hmm? scansion it is it is known as scansion okay a meter unstress followed by a stress is said to be i am is it clear unstress followed by a stress is said to be an i am so uh, i am big pentameter in i am big pentameter there will be five feet hmm? five feet uh, five i am five i am will be there rhyme royal stanza consists of seven lines usually in iambic pentameter and the rhyming scheme is a b a b b c z okay anyway this person has adapted hmm, rhyme royal scheme from french french ballads and italian stanza form has you know that english is the youngest language hmm? somewhat 10000 uh, words have been borrowed from french hmm? similarly 15000 uh, or more I have been borrowed from Italian language. Mm? So these are the I am getting you the different reasons why this person has been go- called the father of English language. Actually, he is the one who refined the language. Okay, old English language is pretty difficult to understand, but he is the one who has introduced the so-called rules in poetry. Mm? I mean, poetry writing. He also introduced eight-line decasyllabic stanza and heroic couplet. Heroic couplet is nothing but iambic pentam rhymed iambic pentameter. Okay, it is rhymed iambic pentameter lines. If it is unrhymed, if the lines are not rhyming, it is said to be blank verse. Okay, I repeat, heroic couplet is nothing but rhymed iambic pentameter. So he is the person. So now tell me why he has been called the father of English poetry. Now come on, give me the answers. Yeah. Okay. the english language become standardized yeah is to learn dialect ma'am he standardized the english language um, yes yes he standardized the english language apart he is the first one to teach uh, art of vers- versification then he is the one who found the english dialect okay he is the one who found the english dialect and left it as a language and he uh, he found i mean he introduced rhyme royal scheme to english poetry from french hmm now let's see his french and latin influences see jeffrey chaucer was a voracious reader hmm? and uh, this person hmm, he was influenced by latin and french literature especially hmm, uh, uh like uh, dante alighieri francisco petrarch giovanni boccaccio hmm? see from boccaccio he borrowed the materials for trollius and cressida and canterbury tales i mean the poem that we are going to discuss right now that is canterbury tales hmm? he has drawn the materials for canterbury tales from boccaccio's hmm? the cameron the cameron oh okay the cameron uh, we will discuss that later boccaccio's poetry's name is the cameron so who are the three uh, latin poets who have influenced i mean chaucer dante alighieri francisco petrarch giovanni boccaccio Hmm? he modeled them not only um, i mean jeffrey chaucer hmm? who was influenced by uh, who um, deeply influenced by three poets i mean almost all middle english poets were influenced by these italian writers okay so don't forget the fact that those who are preparing for competitive exams hmm? net or something like that please note this he borrowed materials for canterbury tales from boccaccio boccaccio's decameron decameron d e c a m e r o n decameron okay i forgot to include that in the slide maybe in um, the next slides we will discuss about decameron have you got the spelling d d for d for donkey okay d decameron d e c a m e r o n decameron boccaccio's decameron principal book hmm? from where he borrowed the materials for canterbury tales hello can you hear me yeah madam yeah yeah, yeah. yes ma'am okay so yeah it's over here the De- uh, bocacious decameron having different characters tell stories seem to have an obvious inspiration for canterbury tales let me tell you something we do have similar tales like uh, uh, canterbury tales and uh, decameron hmm? Uh, I think you are familiar with Panchatantra tales, hmm? Arabian Thousand and One Arabian Nights. 
tail within a tail many tails isn't it so canterbury tale is also like that hmm? story about storytelling hmm you can link with that you are literature students so whenever you write hmm, your writing should be comparative okay you should compare you should compare with other literature you should compare with other poems and hmm? so this poem is ab about hmm, storytelling from petrarch he derived the story that became clerk's tale in canterbury tales let me tell you there are many tales in canterbury uh, tales okay but uh, there are altogether 17000 lines in canterbury tales 17000 lines but you needn't have to study 17000 lines you have only uh, somewhat 800 lines to study hmm? that is prologue anyway it is chaucer who translated dante's divine comedy and other major works to english now we, uh, why uh, we are discussing why this person is very important in english language hmm? because he is the one who uh, have uh, one who has translated hmm, dante's famous work divine comedy into english now before discussing about canterbury tales we need to have an idea about the english during um middle english period okay so evolution of let's discuss about evolution of english hmm? old english period <clears throat> please not this old english period it's from owens yeah old english period is from 597 ad to 1100 ad hmm? and see old english language is entirely different from the one that we use today hmm? i hope you are familiar with that beowulf is the most famous literary work of the period and author is anonymous okay i mean all those literature written during hmm, which has written uh, which have been written during old english period hmm, exhibit uh, exhibited the quality of G uh, germanic english i i hope that uh, i hope you know that english is a language that has uh, derived from uh, germanic language hmm, that you will study in history of uh, english now next period middle english period 1100 ad to 1500 ad chaucer period so mark this chaucer belong to middle english period hmm? and the period starts from 1100 ad to 1500 ad geoffrey chaucer is the most important writer of this period and the most important work of the period is none other than canterbury tales okay so and the literature of this period exhibited the uh, i mean influence of french and italian literature hmm? don't uh, please don't shuffle with old english period old english literature exhibited the quality of germanic literature whereas middle english literature exhibited the qualities of french and italian literature now modern english period hmm, it starts from 1500 ad to the present okay and see 15 mold mo modern english period 1500 ad to the present i mean famous authors hmm? shakespeare milton swift uh, wordsworth charles dickens the elite i mean present authors now chaucer's language we have already seen that this person belong to the middle english period hmm? now other than english french latin were the other two languages used by people in england hmm? french the language of aristocracy i mean all those courtiers and king they use french hmm? then clergy and scholars in church they use latin and english was the language of commoners hello can you see the slide If you are not able yes, to see, if you are not able, yes, ma'am. Yes, able to see, yes. okay, okay. If you are not able to see the slide, you you please inform me. I will share it again, okay? Because whatever details I am conveying through this slide is are very important. Okay. Now, yeah. I hope you are familiar with the difference in pronunciation uh, of Middle English. Hmm. than that of the modern english i mean the pronounce actually there is a great difference in pronunciation from the one that we use today okay in middle english hmm, a sound is brought as that hmm, the modern english father like see when we pronounce when hmm, nowadays w h e n is pronounced as when isn't it when when hmm? in those time it is uh, it was pronounced as one one okay can you see the words when w h a n when 
class can you see this double yes. yeah yeah yes, so yes. in modern yes, in modern english this is w h e n when hmm? in modern english the w h e n when but in middle english this was pronounced as one in modern english this is april okay this is april month month april middle english april april this is march march but hot this is small in s m a l l small in modern english but in middle english smaller smaller you got it smaller this is ram ram so i mean a sound mm, it was broad mm, it was uh, they pronounced they, they pronounce a sound a mm, little bit in a broad way short e has the same pronunciation in modern english small let can you see this one smaller sooty melody oh one second these words smaller sooty melody young seek this is the way how they pronounce these words so wherever there are vowels they stressed it hmm? if the vowel, even even if vowel uh, letter comes at the end of a word they pronounce this they stressed it in modern english we will pronounce small suit melody young seek isn't it but in middle english these words are pronounced in this way small sooty melody young seek i hope you have got an awareness about the pronunciation pronunciation was entirely different uh, different from the modern english okay yes ma'am okay yes ma'am okay next one long e as hmm? long a sound sweat breath heat seek a uh, a uh, a uh. e is pronounced as a sweat sweat breath breath the seek then this one g drop drop t night then this one r sound is trilled we know that nowadays we won't actually oh, we indians have a hmm, tendency to hmm, roll our tongue but english people they don't roll their tongue tongue isn't it april r tender courageous modern english april tender courageous but the way they pronounce those words april. yeah april trilling they are trilling the tongue they will roll their tongue have you understood they they stress r just like malayalam sound okay just like malayalis they used to roll their tongue r r r this what is guttural i mean see see it is a sound that comes from um, i mean deep throat G deep throat guttural sounds okay now now england during the period uh, period of chaucer so before getting into canterbury tales you need to know the condition of england hmm? political uh, social hmm, condition of england and 13th century hmm, broadly 14th century hmm, england that was a very corrupted period uh, okay feudalism was coming to an end hmm. feudalism was coming to an end anyway that period witnessed tremendous social political and economic changes in england hmm. now still you can see some uh, elements of feudalism but the century witnessed the growth of many cities like london okay then uh, commerce hmm? commerce and uh, other industry gave rise to the merchant class okay until then there were only three classes in england till chaucer's period there were only three classes in england hmm? aristocratic class clergy class and commoners okay i repeat till chaucer's period hmm? i mean before his before his period okay sorry before his period there were only three classes aristocratic clergy class and third one commoners but from chaucer's period onwards hmm, uh, he, um, i mean people began to witness many changes in england hmm, feudalism hmm, at, actually it has reached uh, it, its last stage hmm, because 
industry, commerce, etc., have been progressed, and that has resulted to the rise, uh, gave rise to the merchant class people. Hmm? Let me tell you something. Uh, at that time in England, there were only two lakhs fifty thousand people. It, it states it was estimated that there were only some less than three lakhs people in England. Less than three lakhs. Okay, and Black Death plague. Hmm? It has swept England thrice. I think you are familiar with the Black Death, hmm? bubonic plague, and all hmm? that has swept England thrice, and England has witnessed holy wars. Those who are familiar with history, I think you are familiar with the hundred years of war between France and England, isn't it? It is the longest war in history. Yes, madam. Yeah, hundred yes, years. Sir. Yeah, hundred years of yeah. war. Hundred years of war between French and French and England. England. Yeah. So England has witnessed many political and social changes like that. Then church, hmm, church, church uh, I mean the growth of the church. Let me tell you, church hmm, and clergy people were very much corrupted during those time. Okay, then rise of I mean uh, many universities like Oxford hmm, and Cambridge. So these are the major changes of Chaucer's England. Okay, so when you write an essay. Hmm, don't simply write the story if uh, if you are uh, asked to write the the very social political background of the england you have to include all these points in your essay it does uh, it doesn't matter whether you have written uh, 10 or 20 pages what they are looking for is for, for points okay what they are looking for um, in the essay is points so you must include all these points now the next thing now let's discuss about canterbury tales hmm So I told you, Canterbury Tales. It's a collection of twenty-four stories. Twenty-four hmm? stories. Our uh, present Canterbury Tales is a collection of twenty-four stories. It's written about seventy thousand lines. Hmm? Written in Middle English by Geoffrey Chaucer. Just like Panchatantra Tales, hmm? Arabian Night, Thousand and One Arabian Nights. This is a story about storytelling. Story about storytelling. Hmm? Meta, meta, meta fiction type story within a story. Okay. Now, the very uniqueness of this Canterbury Tales hmm, lies in its characterization. Okay, uh, Chaucer. Hmm, I told you there are twenty-four tales uh, told by different characters. There are twenty-nine characters from different strata of English society. Hmm? He has drawn so many. See, you know why this Canterbury Tale have stood the test of time. Hmm? It is written in thirty fourteenth century, but still we are reading. Still, it is prescribed in the syllabus. Hmm? Why? What's the reason? Hmm? Because it's the first book written in uh, proper English, standard English. And, uh, that is one reason. That is one reason. And the second reason is, hmm, this man was able to portray, I mean, tw uh, people from all strata of English lives. Hmm. I mean, this can entertain all readers from all centuries, from 13th to 21st century. The work was able to entertain all. Re I mean, uh, readers from all classes. Even if you read this, you will, it will bring a smile on on your face. This work has truly stood the test of time. All characters in prologue to Canterbury Tales are drawn from different class of 14th century. In uh, English society. Okay, now I told you. Uh, let uh, now let us summarize the work in few lines. Let's see. See, poem. Mm, this poem. There's a long poem. It speaks about a pil pilgrimage. Mm? Anyway, there are twenty nine pilgrims. Mm? Plus Chaucer and his host. There will be thirty one members. Please note the number. There are twenty nine pilgrims. Mm? And Charles is the narrator. Hmm? Charles is a character as well as he is a narrator. Remember, ma please mark it. Geoffrey Charles is a narrator as well as a character. Hmm? So twenty-nine pilgrims plus Charles plus hmm? the host of the Tabarden hmm? that makes thirty-one members. Okay, let me tell you the story in a nutshell. So on a spring day, twenty-nine pilgrims traveling from Tabard Inn in Southwark to the shrine of Thomas Becket in Canterbury Tales, that which is fifty fifty-five miles away from uh, England, 
Now, do, what what do you know about Thomas Becket? Have you heard about Thomas Becket, Saint Thomas Becket? About him, you will study in detail in uh, MEG two, that is in British drama. You have a yeah, drama. in modern cathedral. Yeah, that's a famous cathedral uh, cathedral in uh, England. Yes. Apart from that, what do you know about Thomas Becket? Have you heard about him? Oh. Okay. Uh, anyway, you will in MEG two. You will study more about him. Uh, the Saint Thomas Becket. Hmm? He was he was a libertine at first. He was a close friend of Henry II, Henry II. L uh, later, uh, Henry II and Thomas uh, Becket got into dispute, hmm? and uh, the Henry II has given order to kill Thomas Becket. Uh, Henry II's uh, knights they have. Kill Thomas Becket in the Cathedral of Canterbury. Okay, thereafter, hmm, after so, uh, so many years, he uh, he has been canonized. Hmm? He has become a saint. And Canterbury, I mean, Shrine of Thomas Becket is believed to have so many healing qualities. People are going to, uh, I mean, those twenty nine pilgrims are going to Canterbury, hmm? Shrine of Thomas Becket, just because they believe that the particular sender. Has got some great healing qualities. He he is quick in giving blessing to those people who come to him. Okay, so all those people who are going to Canterbury, they will be having some kind of diseases. Okay, they will be having some kind of diseases. That is why they are going to get blessings from Saint Thomas Becket. I told you he is a martyr. Hmm? He was killed by the followers of Henry II. Actually, Henry II and Thomas Becket were great friends once. Later, they got after becoming the Archbishop. Saint Thomas Becket was the Archbishop of England. Okay, he was the Archbishop of England. One after becoming Archbishop of England, his character changed. Hmm? He became a very good human, and he has excommunicated. He has excommunicated several uh, followers of Henry II hmm, for their immoral ways. Hmm? After that, uh, two became. Hmm? Uh, uh, um, uh, enemies. That is the reason why he was killed in the cathedral. Hmm? And thus he became a martyr. And after several uh, years, this person was canonized. Now he is the saint of Canterbury. So who is the saint of Canterbury? Saint Thomas Becket. Thomas Becket. So twenty-nine pilgrims are uh, going to seek his blessing. Now, I told you this is a story about hmm, storytelling. Then, who suggested about the storytelling? Hmm? Uh, uh, apart from twenty-nine pilgrims and Chaucer, we have a host. Host in the story. His name is Harry Bailey. Okay, Harry Bailey. Uh, he is the one who suggested about the storytelling because uh, fifty-five miles on the top of the horse was a tedious journey, isn't it? Nowadays we have different uh, transportation. It's not a big deal to cover fifty-five miles, but in fourteenth century, covering fifty-five miles that was a tedious journey. Of course, so in order to make that journey enjoyable hmm, and pleasurable, this person, host of that Tabard Inn, hmm, uh, he suggested that they have to tell story. So actually, the some <clears throat> story is like this. See, Geoffrey Chaucer. Hmm, Uh, he's a narrator as well as a character in Canterbury Tales. Hmm? He was waiting for the next day, hmm? waiting for the next day, so has to uh, resume his journey. Okay, at that time only twenty-nine pilgrims reached that inn. I hope you know what an inn is. Tabard. The name of the inn is Tabard Inn. Okay, please remember that. When uh, okay, the, uh, Chaucer was allowed to their company. When Chaucer was allowed to their company, what's the number now? Thirty, isn't it? Thirty, yeah. So the next day, uh, when they uh, when they are about to resume their journey to Canterbury Tales, uh, so uh, sorry, 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 Canterbury. Uh, I mean, host of the Tabard Inn, he suggested that see this journey is of course going to be very uh, tedious. So uh, let me uh, make a suggestion in order to make it more enjoyable. Each one, I mean, how many members are there? Twenty nine members, isn't it? So each one mm -hmm. of them should tell. Two tales on their way to Canterbury and two tales on their way back home. Okay, so so each person has to tell how many tales? Four tales, isn't it? Four tales. So altogether, how many? 
imagine 30 30 pilgrims are there 13 to 4 how many tales will be there if each person tells four tales on their way to canterbury and way back to home 120 tales will be there isn't it so that was the condition put forward by host Mm. And the best story uh, teller would uh, uh, he would uh, get a sumptuous dinner. Mm. What is the price? What is the price for the storyteller? I mean, I mean, one who wins the uh, game, he would get a sumptuous dinner served by the host. So you should remember all these points. If Chaucer had completed his original plans, there would have been one twenty tales. Okay. See, if all these, th I mean, 29 pilgrims plus Chaucer, if they had told four tales, then there would have been 120 tales in total. But how many tales are there in Canterbury Tales? T tell me. Um, originally, how many tales are there in Canterbury? 24. Only, 20, only 24 tales. His original plan was to write 120 tales, but ended up in writing 24 tales. Okay. Now... So I have already discussed this point that the place is believed to have many great, great healing qualities. Mm, that is why people are heading to Canterbury. Mm, and only, see, only few people, mm, only a few people are going to Canterbury for religious reason. Most of the people are going for their personal reasons. Okay, please mark that. So, uh, I told you, Canterbury Tale is a long poem. Hmm? So before the Canterbury uh, tale uh, start, I mean tales, individual tales start, Chaucer gives hmm, a description about each of his characters in the prologue. Hmm? I, I, I repeat, Canterbury tale is a long poem, long poem of 24 tales, hmm? including prologue, prologue plus 24 tales. Have you got the structure of the poem? 20, prologue plus 24 tales but you don't have to study 24 tales you have only one tale to study none nuns priest tale hmm? you have only one tale that is nuns priest tale but you have to study the prologue in prologue he gives the uh, character uh, i mean description of each of his characters there are 29 pilgrims right uh, from different strata of society English society. So in prologue, he's describing all these characters in detail. Have you understood what we are going to study? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I had a small doubt. Uh, yeah. well, well, was his original work published or is there reason to believe like we would have lost the rest of the tales and only 24 are available? No, no, no. He has written only 24, uh, 24 stories. 24. So it was published. I mean, it yeah. was printed in some form. Only 24. He hasn't completed 120 tales. He had okay, or, he originally had a he he originally had a plan to write 120 tales, but when published, there were only 24 tales. Okay. Okay. So these are the characters. Please take the screenshot of the character list. So class, I told you, you have to study prologue to Canterbury, not the entire poem, only prologue to Canterbury. So there are some words, 700, 800 lines in this po uh, prologue. So not the line number. Narrator 20, about night, you can start from 43. Uh, character description of squire start from 83. 81 yeomen start from 103 prioress start from prioress plus three see this prioress is accompanied by three priests have you seen plus three yes ma'am yeah so, yes ma'am uh, yeah the prioress okay. is accompanied by three priests that's why plus three anyway character description of prioress starts from line 22 about monk from 169 friar to one two merchant two eighty Oxford cleric two ninety five surgeon at low three one nine Franklin three forty one Gilsman Abadasha Gilsman means working class working class people uh what else uh we can say that middle class people okay Habadasha Dyer 
carpenter weaver carpenter yeah uh, carpet maker 371 cook 390 skipper or shipman skipper or shipman please write there shipman 398 <clears throat> if you're reading the poem you may come across the word shipman skipper or shipman okay uh, doctor of physic 421 let me tell you how you read this wife of bath in modern english we read wife of wife of bath isn't it but in middle english wifi 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 of bath wifi wif wif have you understood the pronunciation wifi yes wherever there yes. is wherever yeah. there is vowels and vowel sounds we will stress it and it has got some um, i told you long e e is pronounced as e i is pronounced as e hmm? and e is pronounced as long e now parson 488 plowman 539 miller line number 561 mansipul 585 read 605 samana 641 partner 689 and one more thing i wanted to tell you is that see it is impo i know it is pretty difficult to study all these characters at a stretch so for exam point of view let me tell you the list of important characters please mark please if you have a book and a pen you may please note down night is very important have you got it night night sometimes you will get annotation about night so if you're getting an annotation about night you have to write annotation in three paragraphs okay you have to write annotation in three paragraphs first paragraph you may give a brief introduction about author and about canterbury tales don't write the biography of the author okay please don't write the biography of the author simply just uh, just uh, mention that uh, he is the father of english language the most popular work of the middle english and why he is, has been considered as a father of uh, english poetry then you can mention about canterbury tales importance of canterbury tales then you can summarize canterbury tales in a line or two in the introductory paragraph have you got it have you got the structure of introductory paragraph yes now as well in second line in uh, in second stanza just translate this translate the annotation if you're getting a paragraph about night you may please translate it mm? because uh, translation is given in at the back of the textbook mm? uh, if you have the te uh, igno textbook at the back of your text you will have modern english translation mm? the one that is prescribed uh, for study is middle english middle english poem mm? but it, it will be pretty difficult for you to study middle english poem so when you read the uh, middle english canterbury tales please compare it with the modern english translation okay modern english translation so that won't be a big deal for you so you can compare and study and uh, let me tell you one thing if you are familiar with the summary and the characters of canterbury tales then it is not going to be a big problem when you get a uh, character for exam because if when you see the character hmm, when you see the place name or when you see something related to the particular character you can easily uh, understand oh this is about the particular character knight or this is about your man or friar so the first and foremost thing which i would like to tell you is have a clear cut hmm? idea about the summary character and their characteristics got it it's a long poem it's a long poem and let me tell you it is impossible for you to go line by line hmm? but if you are able to go line by line it will be better or else have a uh, just read the summary then just read the poem one time you cannot mug up you cannot mug up this poem, uh, poem just like uh, just like you have done in your previous uh, i mean degree classes degree classes you might have learned a poem that of 300 lines 400 lines that you can mug up but this poem is very impossible uh, it's impossible just because it is written in middle english now please note down the character list night Hmm? then squire yeoman prior as monk friar this much is important first have you seen the section till friar knight squire yeoman prior as monk friar this much is important now the next important character is oxford cleric you may please note down oxford cleric have you seen that oxford cleric that line is very important now you may come to wife of i mean wife of bath have you seen this wife of bath weave of bath that is very important then summer summoner and partner 
very important and let me tell you there are only three virtuous character only three good characters in canterbury tales hmm? i told you this canterbury tale is a social commentary satire a social satire actually uh, yes jeffrey chaucer hmm, has given a picture of 14th century england hmm? that was very corrupted then hmm? england was very corrupted then uh, so the three good characters are hmm, parson and yeah parson and plowman and oxford cleric so tell me who, who are the three virtuous character in canterbury tales there are only three virtuous characters Parson, Parson, Loman, Oxford. Please not the line numbers. Please not. Please not the line numbers. Rest of the characters are very malicious, shrewd, and cunning. Okay. Rest of the characters are very malicious, shrewd, corrupted. Not the line numbers. Yeah. Uh, shall I sh change the slide? Ma'am, uh, ma'am, just a moment. Uh, do we need to include host and narrator along with knight, squire, and yeoman, players, and all? Yes, yes, you have to. You have to, ma'am. And one more thing, I wanted to ask you. Yeah, tell me. Uh, because I was going through this book. I am from a non-English background. Like I have yeah. been MPhil in political science and all, but not not related to literature. So okay. There are so many, uh, you know, Spenserian stanza, Octavian rhyme. So it is difficult for me to understand all those things. And they are saying this word needs to be stressed. And they have uh, given a kind, a particular kind of a mark, and all. How to, you know, do we have to stress that? No, 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 no. Actually, and nowadays it's not asked for the exam. Okay, you, you okay. didn't okay. have to study right now. Anyway, uh, yeah. it'd be better if you have an idea about these kind of uh, meters, <laughs> time, and all. Yeah. Ma anyway, that we will we will discuss in the coming class. Okay, don't worry, don't worry about that. Sure, ma'am. Thank you. Anyway, let me tell you. Uh, for your knowledge, let me tell you. I'm I'm also from a <laughs> non-literature background. Uh, actually, hi. I had my graduation in basically after that only I done my post graduation in literature. Hmm? Not okay. a big deal. Not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, so let's discuss about the class structure during Chaucer's time. Hmm? Class structure during Chaucer's time. <laughs> Ruling class. So these twenty-nine, I told you, these twenty-nine characters belong to different strata of English society. So knight and squire, they belong to ruling class. Hmm? They, uh, then clergy class: monk, friar, prioress, parson, summoner, and partner. Then middle class: Franklin Reeve. Oh, sorry, Franklin Reeve, doctor of psych, Oxford student, wife of bar, surgeon of law. They belong to the middle class. Now, trade, working class, trade class, gilsman, cook, miller, horse, manciple, and merchant. They belong to the trade class. Peasant, shipman. Actually, the skipper is shipman. Plowman and yeoman belong to peasant class. Okay, peasant, peasants, peasant. Now, let's discuss those characters in detail. So, the first character that Chaucer describes in in his Canterbury as knight. Okay, knight, knight. So as we have seen, he is belong to the ruling class. Mm. Uh, he is very godly dressed. Then he is very strong, mm. and he has fought in many battles. Then. Just like every knight, he is very wise, modest, distinguished, chivalrous, truthful, honourable, and courteous. Let me tell you something. Whatever thing that Chaucer has told about his character, that is ironic. Hmm? It's, that is an irony. Actually, all his characters are exactly opposite of that. Got it? This is a satire. First and foremost thing you, that you have to remember about Canterbury Tale is that it is a satire, a social satire. So, if someone is said to be good, and he's he is actually exactly opposite of that. Got it? Hmm? Yeah. Of all battles he fought, none were secular wars. They were all religious wars. Let me tell you uh, about knight. He says that he is very chivalrous. Hmm? Uh, very courteous, hmm, adventurous, and all. He has fought in many battles. Where, hmm, wherever he has gone, hmm, there he had uh, fought for something. Okay, but let me tell you, being a knight, um, 
see he's supposed to fight for his country isn't it you might have seen many english movies what what, what are the um, actually common characteristic of a knight rescuing damsels engaging in fight protecting commoners isn't it these are the qualities of a knight but this person this person has mostly engaged in religious wars the next person is squire squire is actually the son of knight okay he's a son of knight and he's uh, taking lessons to become a knight he's attending uh, yeah he's taking he's going to become a knight <clears throat> then see his, look at his dressing style hmm he's um, he's wearing hmm dress usually worn by women hmm embroidered like a meadow bright dress hmm his gown was short and sleeves long and wide then let me tell you actually he's he says that he is very brave he he pretends that he very brave but uh actually he is mostly interested in taking care of his locks hair medical hmm? he's very much conscious about his appearance unlike knight and squire unlike knight and squires he, this person is very much interested in taking care of his lock very conscious about his appearance okay then 24 into 7 hmm and he spends his time in singing hmm writing poetry horse riding dancing and all hmm and this person instead of taking uh, lessons on battles hmm? and uh, fencing hmm he always fought on behalf of his lady actually he's wooing a lady he's too he's, he's a too good lover hmm but too good in sorry is too bad in fighting and all okay then he follows his father i told you square is the son of knight hmm uh, uh, actually he doesn't have any manly qualities this person doesn't have any manly qualities he is an effeminate version effeminate version okay he dresses just like that of a lady hmm and he is very conscious about his appearance hmm he spends his time in playing flute uh yeah serenading ladies hmm likes poetry and horse riding okay so that's all about squire now yeoman is another character so let me tell you during those times servants maids etc they will be imitating their masters hmm which you will study in mg2 british drama in interludes and all you will study that in detail yeoman is the servant of squire and knight i told you squire and knight are father and son hmm and yeoman is the squ- uh, servant of squire and knight and he has accompanied them and simply accompanied them hmm so dress so he has imitated the squire and knight hmm he actually he has dressed in the same way hmm how they have dressed uh see now yeoman belong to the peasant class hmm yeah he carries a hmm a sword and a dagger and a hunting horn hmm then uh, he is dressed in uh yeah he has he had a coat and a hood of green hmm then he also carried a bracelet hmm as a shield guard from the bow and uh, along with that he he also has a medal of saint christopher then and what has been mentioned about see so many i hope you can see this uh, details if you want you can take a screenshot and he is very and he is very serious just like see has he imitates squire and knight he pretends to be very serious okay ma'am yes. can i ask you one doubt yes 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 ask me ma'am ma'am uh, when you were talking about the three good characters in this tale Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about yeoman or plowman? Plow, plow, plowman, plowman, no, plowman. Okay, yeoman, okay. uh, yeoman is actually uh, uh, serves as a foil to knight and squire. Actually, yeoman is the servant of knight and squire, right? So he'll be imitating his masters. If they are good, their servants are also good. If they are bad, then their servants are very bad. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. so this person acts as a wood, woodsman hmm okay he, even though he is a servant he is fit for a uh, job in woods hmm he's pretty good in hunting and all
Now, next character is Prioress. Hmm? She's a nun. Hmm? Belong to clergy class. So let me tell you something. In 14th century, many wealthy class, hmm? many wealthy people, hmm? many uh, wealthy people have lost their status and they were forced to live the uh, place then. Hmm? And they were, see, it is it would be impossible for the ladies to mingle with the commoners, isn't it? See, in 1970s, in India, so many uh, wealthy families have lost their properties, right? Uh, due to some reason. So, so many, um, I mean, there are dominant classes, residual classes, isn't it? Dominant and residual. So, sometimes uh, those one class which, uh, which has been dominant in a particular period, after some time, they won't be dominant. They might have uh, lost their power. Similarly, prior as she was very wealthy once. Hmm? But due to some reason, hmm, uh, I mean, families, hmm, wealthy, uh, upper class family, they have lost their privilege. Hmm? They have lost their uh, authorities. For that reason, they were forced to um, leave their hometown and go somewhere else. Hmm? But it will be truly uh, what? impossible for ladies from no uh, noble class to mingle with downtrodden is it possible for the noble ladies to mingle with downtrodden hmm? no it is not possible so what they did is they joined uh, monasteries so the best way uh, for those noble ladies is to join monastery actually all those ladies who have joined monastery they haven't joined there not out of religious reason or due to dedication or something else Hmm. Uh, they have take, uh, taken those uh, place as a shelter, a temporary shelter. Have you understood what I'm trying to say? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. That is a temporary shelter for upper class ladies. I told you, monastery or um, what do you call it? Mm, these type of uh, churches are simply a sh temporary shelter for upper class ladies just because they can't go uh, go anywhere else this is the best place hmm? so the way she is a nun now hmm? prioress her real name is Mag uh, madame egletain hmm? uh, anyway i have been included here if you open the textbook and read the lines you will get her name her name is madame egletain hmm? yeah she's a nun and she uh, she uh, she is wearing a veil, hmm? a clock, a very graceful one, and she also uh, has a bracelet hmm? made uh, made out of jewels and precious gems. Then she ha she is very beautiful. Her features, hmm? her facial features are very well defined. Hmm? Then let me tell you something: when she eats something, she takes a great care so that no food particle is fallen from her mouth. Actually, she has a very good idea about table manners. She knows table manners very well. She won't, uh, when she eats something, she won't open her mouth wide. She won't open her mouth. She will slowly open her mouth and she will take a great care to put the food particles inside her mouth and she will close it without making any crushing or grind, uh, grind, uh, grinding sound. She will eat it slowly in a graceful manner and she will also take a great pain so that no food particle is for uh, is uh, um, uh, falling from her mouth and stay in her dress okay so she's very conscious about uh, table manners so what does it show about her is she a pride as is she really uh, meant for this profession what do you think What do you think? It shows about her upbringing as a noble lady. Yeah, actually, uh, she's not meant for this profession. Mm? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah, she cannot withstand a cry of mm, a mouse that has been caught in a trap, mm? and she keeps three small hounds in with her. She. See, see, she had three small hounds with her, which she treated very gently and tenderly. Hmm? Now, she also wears a brooch, brooch. I'm sorry, I haven't included that detail in the slide. And the brooch carries the inscription, Amor Vincit Omnia, A-M-O-R-V-I-N-C-I-T, Omnia, Amor Vincit Omnia. 
uh, let me tell you prior is very important you have to study you have to study this part amor vincit omnia so she wore a gold brooch with an inscription amor vincit omnia meaning is love conquers all so what does it mean she is secretly longing for a worldly life isn't it even though she is a nun now she wanted to uh, live a worldly life isn't it i repeat the characteristics of uh, prioress she is very delicate she is very coy, uh, uh, yeah very coy then her real name is madame eglatine madame eglatine and she is from a noble class who lost her power and that has made her to join monastery okay she is very courteous hmm? too conscious about table manners hmm? actually uh, uh, yeah she imitate all those uh, parisian manners she to uh, she speaks fluent in french fluent french okay she can speak french actually clergy people are supposed to speak latin right latin latin you know that point uh, clergy people uh, people are supposed to uh, use latin but she uh, speaks french now and she also had three hounds she cannot uh, stand the pain she could not stand the pain uh, and would cry if she see if she sees a mouse or something like that caught in a trap she is very delicate just like the princess and queen mentioned in the stories now i am moving on to the next character that is monk monk is the next important character all these characters are very important okay that is why i am describing in detail the next character is monk he he also belongs to the clergy class that is ecclesiastical class church class yeah very wealthy and he is see the dressing fine fur trimmed robe very gaudy dress hmm? usually monk and friars hmm, they are supposed to uh, lead a life by begging isn't it monks and friars how they are uh, how they are supposed to live usually they collect arms hmm? charity uh, isn't it they collect things from people and how they uh, the, and that is the way how they uh, lead a life but this person is very wealthy finely dressed hmm? his ba uh, his bald fat loves hunting you know what's what's his favorite food his favorite food is roasted swan and he keeps hunting dog see he is a monk still he keeps hunting dogs isn't it now and he is an outrider he, uh, he, see if you are going to meet this person he won't be there in the monastery he'll be somewhere out hmm? now yes next character is friar next important character is friar hmm? he to hmm? uh, belongs to wealthy class that is clergy actually these friars are not meant to be that rich but our friar is very rich okay now he is dress uh, he has dressed like a pope hmm? he is only uh, friar is someone who has low rank in church but this person hmm, a normal simple uh, a normal priest hmm, but this person has dressed like a pre uh, pope hmm? he sang is uh, he sang well and he uh, plays that hurdy gurdy and this person is truly immoral okay he has helped many ladies in in getting married this person has helped in help many girls in getting married but only after putting them in trouble have you understood hmm? actually uh, he is not that familiar with the monastery churches or uh, charity houses in england hmm? but he is pretty familiar with inns and uh, inns and other ill fame houses of england have you understood the character of this person hmm yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah his name is hubert h u b e r t hubert hubert he is a womanizer i repeat he is a womanizer alcoholic hmm uh, even though he is a friar he is not that linked with church hmm or charity houses or something like that but this person is very much uh, in touch with inns and ill, ill famed houses of england next one this character is not that important next character is merchant not that important but let's have a look yeah 
belong to the wealthy class hmm? middle class okay well even though it's wealthy uh, since he, they are uh, doing business and all they belong to the merchant class hmm? is colorfully dressed multicolor uh, dressing then he has a uh, what a uh, fucking beard then he travels on a uh, horse then see he always talks about the profit that he had made in business hmm? very talkative very boasting type hmm? but let me tell you this person is actually in debt he says that he's a great merchant of hmm? he's a great merchant uh, of england but this person is actually in next character is oxford clerk oxford cleric first virtuous character this person is virtuous hmm? good character so belong to the middle class hmm? and yeah he was a student at oxford and was he is extremely thin hmm? very thin not like other see all the clergy characters ecclesiastical characters are fair and fat okay they are very fair fat hmm? but this one is very thin hmm? and he rode uh, sorry he ro uh, he rode a very thin horse and his clothes were threadbare hmm? he preferred to buy books rather than clothes and food hmm? even if uh, he is getting money from his friends he will use that money to buy books and clothes okay uh he did not talk often but when he did it was very it was with great dignity and moral virtue is not that talkative okay just like other clergy characters hmm? actually clergy characters are most of the clergy characters are hedonistic hmm? epicurean characters eat drink and be merry okay please note it all clergy characters are hedonistic epicurean character but this person is very reserved he won't talk too much i mean the money that he gets from his friends he use he his he, he spends on books hmm? uh he is not that interested in buying clothes and other gaudy things he seeks morality and virtue the first virtuous character in canterbury tales now i'm moving on to the next man of low hmm? sergeant sergeant of low or the man of low belongs uh, he is a lawyer belong to the clergy class appointed by the king hmm? then about him let me tell you uh, he he put he pretends that he is very wise hmm? he appears to be bis hmm? he appears to be busier hmm? wiser than he really is he always to uh, talks about the cases hmm? similarly just like the lawyers and um, uh, yeah celebrated lawyers of the uh, present he appears to be wiser and busier than he really is is very cunning okay the next character is franklin hmm? Franklin is a large land owner hmm? land owner but uh, he doesn't have a noble birth he spends his money freely enjoying good wine and company okay uh, he is a gluten this person is a gluten he loves eating hmm? his house was always open and he was true epicurean devoting his energy to fine living and was generally liked by other pilgrims I told you what's the main character of this person he is a gluten he loves eating now next characters i mean next set of characters tradesman or haberdasher hmm? trades yeah tradesman carpet maker uh, haberdasher dyer carpenter weaver hmm? they are working class people emerging class people have you understood they are the emerging class i told you 14th century england has witnessed many changes hmm? uh, due to the fall of feudalism actually feudalism uh, that was the last stage of feudalism hmm? england was witnessing the last stage of feudalism hmm? in uh, it has almost fallen and has the dominant class as now going to hmm, become the what in a in short they will become the residual and which uh, which one is going to be the dominant class hmm? working class or merchant class is going to become the uh, dominant class from 14th century onwards so this one they are the emerging class hmm? middle class are the emerging class let me tell you uh, authors of the 
19th and 18th century they despised middle class according to the authors philosophers um, and other writers you know which uh, who are most vicious cunning and um, ambitious which class is very ambitious tell me upper class middle class or lower class which class is the most ambitious class middle middle class yeah middle class middle class that is why authors philosopher writers all those people hmm, despised middle class actually upper class people they just want to mention their status oh we are rich we just wanted to mention the status and lower class people they wanted something to eat okay this day has passed tomorrow we don't know uh, we would be grateful if we get something to eat that is their attitude but upper i mean middle class people they they wanted to improve their status hmm? every now and then they are working hard hmm? they will do anything to attain their target okay so actually uh, these people actually these people work as a foil between upper class and lower class that is why they are said to be the emerging class okay let's see more about the social class of this social status of this people anyway all these uh, characters carpet carpet maker haberdasher dyer carpenter weaver see they uh they have a they have dressed in uniform they dressed in uniform and uh, they uh, uh, all of them have carried an, mm, knives with them mm? and they are very proud that they are representing a class okay since they are the emerging class do you know that all ups, uh, you can easily identify upstart uh, upstarts i mean upstart people from upstart i'm uh, sorry uh, those who have recently gained wealth mm? they are popularly known as upstarts so you can easily identify them how can you identify them <laughs> they'll be dressing very uh, they'll be dressed in gaudy style isn't it uh, shining dress and all They're wearing all the jewels hmm? uh, yeah similarly uh, these people are very proud of their uh, appearance hmm? and uh, yeah and they are accompanied by a cook they have uh, taken a cook along with them let's see social status hmm he belongs to the trade class and this person is going to pilgrims on a particular purpose because he has a sore on a leg hmm so cook is the servant of that tradesman hmm yeah he he knows everything see he knows how to boil bake roast and fry hmm then actually he's a too good cook but the only thing is he had Uh, he had a running sore on his leg next one is the shipman shipman belongs to the peasant class hmm? he is a he is a sailor hmm? he is good in everything actually he knows the oh, uh, he knows uh, ports from mediterranean to baltic he knows almost all ports of the world hmm? he knows everything hmm? uh, then he could even read the stars and you have to Uh, and he is too good in fighting hmm? he knows everything but he doesn't know how to ride a horse hmm? he is too good in all art forms hmm? everything he is uh, good but he doesn't know how to ride a horse hmm? when he sits on a horse he is just like a fish out of water doctor of physic he too belongs to the middle class hmm? uh, very interesting actually more than human physic what he knows is astrology okay he had uh, actually by seeing the people he ca- uh, he can predict hmm, what they are suffering from normally a doctor will understand uh, the ail- uh, ailment of a ta- uh, person by after examining him isn't it after checking his condition only they will come to know uh, what they are suffering from but this person can easily predict what they are suffering from hmm? just because he's too good in astrology okay and um, excuse me ma'am yeah yeah sorry for interrupting but yeah. uh, is this physic uh, the same as today's uh, physique yes exactly but spelling at only okay. spelling is a, a spelling is entirely different 
my dear this is middle english middle english so spelling is different okay 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 thank you and uh, he has got a special love for gold whenever a patient comes to him hmm, he will describes gold you have to take gold like that you know why it has a special we know that gold in a uh, in a in some level is prescribed as a medicine isn't it in allo i don't know in ayurveda and all gold in some level is prescribed for some diseases but this person whoever comes to him he will prescribe gold as a medicine okay but just because he has got a special love for allo metal Hmm? and this person had made a lot of money during plague i told you during chaucer's time england was swept thrice by bubonic plague plague and england's population was reduced to 1 by 3 due to plague many people died due to plague at that time this person reaped a lot of money got it he made a lot of money during that time so you might have understood his character very well what type of person he is isn't it Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he did not read Bible very much. Hmm. He's healthy, but unhealthy in spirit. He's an unhealthy. I mean, not not that religious. Okay, he's going to uh, Canterbury, a uh, Canterbury shrine of uh, Thomas Becket. Just wanted all are going. Oh, come on, let's go and see what's happening there. He's going for that purpose. Understood. All are going to Canterbury, so I am also going. that's all not out of any religious reason and let me tell you one more thing the, uh, people say that he is in deal with druggist hmm? pharmacist okay this person he is a doctor right so normally just like the present uh, contemporary uh, world every doctors hmm, there are a lot of pharmaceuticals right now isn't it a lot of mncs right now so doctors are in league with pharmacist just like that this doctor in 14th century he was in league with druggist so like that also he made lot of money Now, this character is very important class please note this wife of bath or wifi of bath wifi wifi modern english wife of bath in middle english wifi of bath social status hmm? she is a stream stress then she had a kerchief hmm? very expensive kerchief weighed uh, weighed a pound okay that was an ex- uh, full of uh, i mean beautifully uh, embellished with gems then she has married five times and she outlived all her five husbands <laughs> i hope you have understood her character hmm her special talent was her knowledge of all remedies of love and she is quick in she she loves giving advice on uh love okay why she why she is going to canterbury you know she is partially deaf this uh, wife of bath uh, is partially deaf hmm? she is very meek yeah, whenever church is holding something she will be there in the fest, uh, she will be there in the front row of altar okay yeah about wife of bath i told you uh partially is very meek hello yeah. yeah are you trying to say something yes tell me uh no ma'am i was uh, just saying you were discussing about uh, she being very meek that point yeah yeah so see even though she had married five times and outlived her for uh, five uh, husbands she's very humble she's very coy okay you understood <laughs> she she always behaves that has she is always uh, she's at 16 okay she made a point of being fest at the altar or offering in church hmm? uh, she is too good in offering hmm? then uh, she had uh, been to uh, she has been to many places hmm? and on pilgrimages to jerusalem rome hmm? etc etc and she has got a gap tooth hmm? gap tooth this lady is going to canterbury tales uh, sorry can Candab- shrine of canterbury just because she is deaf hmm? she's deaf do you know why people approach hmm? approach wife of bath just because she had a to, uh, hmm? a special talent in giving advice regarding love related love and marriage related issues 
understood a special talent next character is parson hmm? i mean the virtuous the most virtuous one in the canterbury tale not it it's parson if you're getting a question if you're getting a uh, if you're going for some competitive exam and if they are asking you who's the virtuous character hmm? you can write parson so he belong to the clergy class hmm? is very modest even though he's a clergy man he's very uh, mod very poor hmm? uh, then even though he's poor he's rich in holy thoughts hmm? he would give, he would uh, give his uh, uh, money to poor parishioners hmm? see rest of the clergy people are uh, looting people see monk friar prioress hmm? priest etc they are looting people actually okay but this person hmm? uh he gives his scarcely uh i mean uh what i mean the uh, money that he had made hmm, that he is ready to give to parishioners poor parishioners then next character is plowman hmm? plowman is the brother of parson one second plowman is also good hearted just like his brother then uh, he is a farmer hmm, who lives in perfect peace uh, he uh, yeah he loves all people with uh, uh, his heart then he also promptly pays his uh, part to tithes to church not like other uh, people so i told you plowman is the brother of parson don't forget that plowman is the brother of parson he is also as good as his brother got it and he uh, he's a uh, he works very hard and he just like his brother he uh, gives uh, his money to parishioners and to the church okay that's all about plowman mm. then next character is miller mm. miller he belongs to the trade class okay then he has um, he had a wart on his mm, uh, nose then Uh, he is very stout but he is very short stout and short hmm? then he is a wrestler hmm? uh, he, uh, his temper is very bad then he he played a bagpipe as the pilgrim left the town okay he is the one who played pipe pipe not that important and let me tell you he he is not a believer is a non believer hmm he is going to just like doctor he doesn't have any particular reason uh, even though he has a wart on his nose hmm? see all people are going to canterbury tales just because they had some kind of disease and they just want they, um, uh, they want to heal their uh, disease but this person he doesn't believe in uh, thomas becket and all see all are going so let me see what quality that shrine is having hmm. let me go and check you got it that person is going to test the power of thomas becket miller miller it's a non believer blasphemous this person is a blasphemer i hope you know the meaning of a blasphemer whom do we call a blasphemer hello someone who goes or they respect the religion yeah one who books yeah yes yes exactly so he doesn't believe in any kind of uh i mean church or church related things now the next character uh, character is mansiple so mansipal he is a steward at a low house hmm? uh low school okay now he was in charge of purchasing food for those people students in low house hmm? he uh, he was not has learned as lawyers but he is very clever than lawyers okay let me tell you he is a steward he was a servant he is a servant at a low school Hmm? and his job is to get uh, materials food uh, for the school hmm? he is not that as educated as the teachers and students of the low school but he is pretty clever than them got it uh, so he was shrewd uh, in buying that he had been able to put aside a, some money for himself hmm? even though he is buying uh, food for them he is pretty enough to uh, good enough to make money out of it now next character is reeve so reeve 
he belongs to the middle class hm is the manager of a large estate hm he is a very skinny man his temper is very bad hm then uh, uh, he has got a thin legs hm he was a, an able efficient hm uh, what manager hm he is very shrewd he has reaped many rewards from his masters hm then uh, he is very he is a favorite of his employers hm but he is a dreadful nightmare of his employees okay is too good with uh, i mean rich people but is a nightmare to is uh, serves i mean slaves herdsmen workers you know he knows uh, he knows to uh, what handle the situation he knows how to behave with uh, each hmm? now next character is sammana sammana hmm? actually this person is also a clergyman and uh, he brings those accused people i mean those sinners to the church i mean uh, those people who has been excommunicated by the church or those people who has done some mistake or gone against the church hmm? his duty is to bring those people to the church court church has his own court during 14th uh, century okay so this person in charge of bringing those accused people to the court now now uh, this person has leprosy hmm? to make the matter worse hmm? he eats onion garlic hmm? and, and all other um, food uh, hmm? items that is a uh, harmful to his condition he is also an al uh, alcoholic lecherous hmm? see he is a sammana he is a clergy man still see his characters i mean ca uh, his features oh, sorry sorry extremely sorry now just like the friar hmm? he is also associated with those ladies of hmm? ill reputation i hope you know uh, i i hope you have understood ladies of ill reputation i mean he is very much uh, in touch with brothels and all okay sammana is happy to go to the brothels and other inns now next character is partner hmm? actually partner just like the sammana is very much corrupted hmm? uh, partner he has got an official uh, authority from rome to sell the pardons hmm? actually he he sells pardons to the sinners you know what is a pardon it's a pamphlet uh, carrying uh, religious relics hmm? Re religious stuff hmm? so this person uh, uh, has got authority from rome to sell those pamphlets hmm? religious pamphlets to the sinners so when the sinners um, when they read this religious relics hmm? of course they will get some atonement isn't it they will uh, yeah they will feel to sacrifice hmm? so they will uh, feel to repent so for that only partner is selling you and mostly partner is selling uh, what pamphlets or religious relics to people but this person is selling to make money he uh, his bag is full of pamphlets religious things okay and he will uh, sing song in such a way hmm? he had a very loud high pitched voice hmm? yellow hairs hmm? and he will uh, sing and frighten people and make them buy his pamphlets you understood what type of person actually he is not doing his profession instead he takes it as a business he forces hmm, common people to buy his pamphlet hmm? so he in that case he is not a clergy man he is actually a businessman okay he is a fake who makes money in exchanging and he is quick in giving pardon to those people who gives him money he got him he got he got his character what sort of a person he is yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am actually we know that it's pretty difficult to get pardon from the church for doing uh, immoral things but this person he will easily he he easily forgives uh, to uh, people who gives him money that's a particular
uh, I mean, that is the speciality about the part now. So that's all about the 29 characters. Let me tell you one thing. Our prioress, I hope you remember the prioress, Madame Eglatine. She has got a nun. She is accompanied by a nun. And in turn, that nun is accompanied by three priests. Actually, the three priests are not that important, but the story told by one of the priests is very important, which is included in your syllabus. Okay. So, and uh, so we have covered the 29 characters. Hmm? Now, after the 29 character, now we are going to discuss Harry Bailey. I mean, the host of the Tabard Inn. Those 29 pilgrim plus Chaucer, hmm, they have uh, took, um, what? They have, actually, they have lodged in the inn run by host Harry Bailey. Okay. Actually, he is the person who suggested that each one should tell a story uh, hmm, on their way to Canterbury Tales and way back home. Hmm, and he is the one who promised them that he'll be rewarding uh, them a free meal. And apart from that, uh, he also told them that he'll be accompanying them. He will be accompanying them. So let me tell you, uh, after, after this decision, there had, a, there had been a feud among those pilgrims about telling the tales. Okay, I will tell the story first. I will tell the story first. So when the feud started, they have decided to take a lot. Mm -hmm. So the one that draws smallest draw, uh, straw will tell the story first so it is the knight who told the story first anyway that is not included in the uh, syllabus only character description is important prologue is basically about the character description have you understood don't mix with the canterbury entire canterbury tale canterbury tale is a pretty long work and you don't have to study that you only need to study the character description hmm, of 29 pilgrims got it now, moving on to Rawners. Actually, Canterbury Tales comprises many literary Rawners. Hmm? I told you that it's a story within a story, 24 tales. And 24 tales belongs to different uh, Rawners. Some are courtly romance, some are fabulous, some are exemplum, some are allegory, some are fables, some tales are sermon, religious composition, like that. Now, exemplum is a um, what? Uh, introduce a moral message or oh, mm, moral message it will have some religious elements in it here in this canterbury tales pardon's tale is an exemplum then tales told by knight squire etc are courtly romance mm? knight's tale wife of bath's tale etc are courtly romance i hope you know what a romance is uh, courtly romances now fable mm? what is an allegory allegory is uh, is a tale in which Vices and virtues are personified. Having to see Aesop, I think you are familiar with Aesop's fable. Aesop's fable. Hello, class. Are you familiar? Are you familiar with Aesop's fable? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma where, yes, ma yeah, where animals animals can speak, isn't it? Animals speak, think, and act like human beings. That is an allegory. So, wise and virtuous ca characters are personified there. So, like that, uh, the the one that we are going to study, non priest tale. Hmm? Nun priest tale is a uh, beast fable. Please remember that nun priest tale is a fable. Then uh, Fabio is a, sh a show story with snappy ending. Snappy ending means uh, modern. See, modern movies have got a snappy ending. Somewhat irritating, uh, pleasant, but still cold ending. Miller's tale, Reeves tale, Merchant's tale, etc. belong to uh, Fabio. Then Sermon is a religious treaty. Okay, it's a religious uh, poem or really religious tale with a moral story so about i told you canterbury tale is a social commentary first and foremost it's a satire mm -hmm. chaucer act, uh, uh, actually ridicules satirizes the english society of 14th century for various reasons i mean almost all his characters are very much corrupted mm -hmm. in some other way okay uh, they are not true to their uh, truth uh, to their, uh, I mean, the characters that they show in front of others. Now, yeah, so about this, this belongs to many runners. Hmm? Courtly romance, fablio, exemplum, allegory, beast fables, sermon, religious compositions. Now, personifications. 
see i told you uh, different characters uh, gluttony gluttony is represented by hmm, which character i told you do you remember which uh, character is a gluten hmm frank franklin is a gluten so uh, are those people Merchant? no no it, it it is franklin who eats uh, uh who loves to eat eat isn't it he has a store of food then uh, avarice monk friar pa samana partner hmm, they represent slow some are very lazy lust wife of bath hmm, monk friar lusty characters vanity shown by uh, vanity tradesmen see they are emerging class still they are dressed in uh, dressed very godly hmm? uh, then anger represented by miller hmm? shipman so uh, seven deadly sins actually it is mentioned in bible or those people who are from ecclesiastical background i think they are familiar with these th uh, these things so actually gluttony these are vices seven vices seven deadly sins i hope you are familiar with that gluten greed sloth is lazy lust vanity pride anger so these qualities we cannot say these these are qualities but these vices are actually represented by 29 character 20 each uh, i mean uh, each of the 29 characters represent uh, these qualities i mean these vices now some other characters moderation generosity diligence love modesty humility and forgiveness see parson plowman and and clerk Mm, they represent these quality isn't it uh, clerk oxford clerk represent uh, mod, uh, moderation mm? diligence he represent that two qualities moderation and diligence whereas uh, plowman and parson represents generosity modesty hum humility and forgiveness are you able to understand what i'm trying to say hello yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, yeah, yeah. i mean those this yeah, yeah. You please ask me please ask me yes you can ask me ma'am uh, we have uh, i mean we have characterized the uh, characters of uh, a person plowman and oxford cleric ma'am yeah. in which category okay. we can bring host which means harry bailey harry bailey host harry bailey uh, is entirely different he is simply uh, uh, the one who judges the story that they are telling okay okay he has no uh, no major role in the scandabri uh, i mean chaucer is only a narrator hmm? whatever he sees he says that uh, only okay. that 29 pilgrims have main role in scandabri tales okay okay thank so, you ma'am thank you so except that three characters except out of 29 characters 26 are wise wise i mean they are bad characters Mm, malicious characters greedy characters so they represent gluttony avarice sloth lust vanity pride anger mentioned in bible but plowman parson and cleric mm, i mean clerk he i mean they represent moderation generosity diligence love modesty humility and forgiveness have you understood so actually uh they are don't take the mass don't take the 29 characters has uh simply characters actually they represent bad and good qualities in society got it i hope you yes, are yeah please take the screenshot of this please take the screenshot of this yes ma'am we have taken thank you ma'am okay next one major themes major themes of canterbury love sex fraternity power of church betrayal rivalry then religion gender etc the major themes love squire sex by friar wife of bath fraternity i mean brotherhood brotherhood group is that tradesman group haberdasher dyer carpenter they represent fraternity because they are they are uniformly dressed and they are uh, they are very proud to present themselves in the front of society then power of the church is represented by the ecclesiastical character betrayal wife of bath uh, then rivalry of course uh, that miller and the reeve had a uh, rivalry uh, between them then religion gender etc the major themes of uh, canterbury 
हेलो ओके नाउ राइमिंग स्कीम एंड मीटर राइमिंग स्कीम एंड मीटर ऑफ कैंडबरी टेल्स Hmm. So the rhyming scheme of the poem. I told you this is a a poem written in heroic couplet. Uh, we have already discussed that. So one of you uh, told me that you are from a non-literature background. So this poem is written in heroic couplet, my dear. Hello, is she still present? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, 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 my dear. So this one, our Canterbury tale is written in heroic couplet. Hmm. Uh, so heroic couplet is nothing but rhymed. iambic pentameter mm-hmm. rhyme iambic have you seen the u type sign u u type sign can you see this yes ma'am this is un- yeah this is unstressed and this one is stressed okay this dash type sign is stressed so unstressed okay. followed by a stressed is said to be an iam iam so like that there will be five iams in a line 1 2 3 4 5 like that you'll be having five mm, iams if there are five then it is said to be iambic pentameter if there are only three then it is said to be iambic trimeter if there are four iambic tetrameter if there is only one iam then it is, it is monometer hmm? if it is six hexameter if it is seven alexandrine if there are seven it is said to be alexandrine Okay, so like this. See, let me tell you. The, uh, we don't have any special rule in uh, dividing this thing into uh, food. Hmm. Actually, it is uh, the way how we pronounce it. Sometimes uh, we will uh, divide this according to our convenience. So has to get. Hmm. I am okay. In more, if you are taking this poem in modern hmm, way. it will be impossible for you to divide in particular i told you the pronunciation is entirely different and especially from every uh shares and of england to canterbury they went see w e can you see this w e n d e yes ma'am yeah. that is modern went okay we will uh, we uh, so the meter the can uh, that chaucer used in writing canterbury tale is iambic pentameter don't forget that uh, when you write an es- when you write the essay or if you even if you are writing annotation please include that this poem is written in iambic pentameter don't forget that and also remember see if you are getting few lines from canterbury tales hmm blindly you may divide the <laughs> line into five hmm divide like this have you have you understood Stre- unstressed followed by a stress hmm doesn't have uh, it doesn't have uh, any, any rules no, no, where to demarcate it like you know where to divide it like and special why is why is that line drawn between specially sp is separated from cially how, how do we come across that what is a syllable what is a syllable anyway you will study that in uh, mg4 uh, let me ask you what is a syllable A yeah, syllable with you know, uh, few uh, words, yeah. few letters Word. with the vowel sound. Yeah, it will have at least one vowel. Not at least one vowel. A vowel. A vowel will be there. So once you get a vowel, okay. just see whether it is stressed or unstressed. And, and, is it stressed? Is it stressed? No, it is not stressed. And, especially, especially, spur, spur, it is stressed, isn't it? So mm-hmm. since you are getting spur, uh, one vowel here, we marked. we need only okay. yeah we no, need only two syllables unstressed followed by a stress is an iam we got two mm. we marked one shelly she lee lee is stressed more than she isn't it mm. like mm. that so in a syllable we will have only one vowel one vowel okay, okay. so once you get a vowel mark whether it is stressed or unstressed it doesn't have any particular rule okay it is uh, the way we pronounce it if it is stressed okay. If it is stressed, hmm, you will mark a dash type sign. If it is not stressed, just put a U. Fine. Now, anyway, uh, Canterbury Tale. The entire poem is written in heroic couplet, same way. I am big pentameter. Now, please take a screenshot. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, it's not. Uh, 
it's it's not possible to read the entire poem still we can read a few lines one second what's the time now i need to wind up oh okay i'm reading this this is mod can you see the poem yes, yes ma'am ma yes, so yes ma'am so this is this yes, is middle english and this is modern english i'm just reading it the few lines okay one that one that april with his shower sooty the drafty of march that pierced to rooty and bath every vein in sweet liquor of which virtue engendered its flower one that suffered as eek with his sweat breath the inspired hack in every hot the heat and tender cops and young sunny see the modern translation when that april with his shower sweet the draught of march has pierced to the root and bath every vein in such liquor of which strength the flower is engendered when the zephyr is also with sweet breath has inspired in every whole time heat so when you read this poem you should compare it with modern english it's not a big deal at the end of your textbook see meg1 text uh if you open the text and if you turn back you can see the modern english translation so compare it and study it won't be a big deal i'm just telling you how to read this poem hmm? pronunciation is entirely different but still you can relate it's not that different it's pretty easy to relate right see the spelling went n n d end launches land shores strands shores see like that some small small differences are there so let me tell you uh i'm just telling you the first uh only the first stanza when that april with his showers sweet hmm, drought of march hath pierced to the root so when the sweet showers of april fall and shoot down through the drought of march to the to pierce the root and bath every vein in such mo moisture hmm, from which there spring fresh flowers we know uh, on which season hmm, when did they decide to go for pilgrim it's in the month of april right so april is the best season hmm? season of spring isn't it so they started to they started uh, to go on um, uh, pilgrimage in the month of april hmm? that season was uh, very sweet because uh, the showers of the april has pierced to the uh, pierced to the uh, root of march i mean march actually it's very bit uh, it's march is bit hot right so uh, after winter only hmm? send it uh spring we do have a poem like that isn't it if winter comes can spring be far behind isn't it so after the winter season hmm, uh spring has come and touched the land hmm, it has awakened the entire uh nature not only people but also uh shrubs plants and animals see so april with its sh uh, sweet showers when it pierces to the land actually it has moist uh, uh, actually it has uh, what Mo uh, moist uh, moisted the trees and shrubs hmm? uh, then young sun has run its half course hmm? young sun see have you seen this uh, spelling s o n n e sun sunny that is sun see this sunny and sun hmm when the zephyr is also with his sweet breath see what is zephyr is zephyr is the west wind zephyr is, uh, is the west wind not only april with and his, uh, i mean sweet showers of april that has uh, what moisted the fresh flower uh, flowers and trees of uh, earth but also west wind also awakened hmm, the land with its sweet breath okay at that time sun is very young why why they said uh, said that sun is young because sun is still young in the month of april isn't it now so during the uh, month of april birds hmm, they make melodies how they will uh, sleep all night with their eyes open people uh, according to the poet people not only people entire world is very happy and their creatures of the world uh, are very happy during the month of april hmm? so nature will prick 
I mean birds who are sleeping with eyes open. Hmm? So they will make music. Then at the, the, this is the time that people hmm, uh, go for pilgrim uh, pilgrimages to long distant lands. I mean people from every nook and corners of England. They are heading to Canterbury. Why they are heading to Canterbury? To seek the blessing of blissful martyr. Who's the martyr? Thomas Beckett. They are heading to uh, uh, Canterbury just because the particular place is uh, very famous for healing call um, healing qualities. Okay. Now, class. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. See, it's not that difficult. This is the very beginning of Canterbury Tales. Soon after this, uh, a description about night begins. Okay, after this line and description about night begins, um, maybe at first you will have some difficulty in reading, but uh, when if you compare it with the modern English, it won't be a big deal. I told you how to read this. More okay. Okay, the next one is I, I'm going to uh, wind up after after prologue to Canterbury uh, tales. There start the uh, tales from. Sorry, sorry. Please mute your mic. I'm getting distracted. Please mute your mic. So after this prologue to Canterbury, uh, we have tales told by different characters. We have 24 tales told by different characters. And you don't have to study that 24 tales, only one tale you have uh, to study, that is non free tale. Which is it? Can you please, please mute the mic, the one who has switched on the mic. Please mute it, please mute it. Okay, you don't have to study this, uh, you have to study non free tale. That is included in your portion. This is a fable. And it is told by nuns, priest, prioress has, prioress is, a, Madam Igletine is accompanied by a nun and she is in turn accompanied by three priests. Hmm? Three priests. One of the priests hmm, tells this tale. Actually, nun priest tale is of 626 lines. Okay. It is a mock epic. Hmm? It is a mock epic and apart from that, it is a fable. Hmm? Uh, the main characters of the nun priest are Chanticleer. Chanticleer is a rooster. Pet Perty Lotley is a hen. And Duan, Duan Russell is a fox. Now, this tale actually blurs the boundary between human being and animal. Because it is normally animals, uh, it, it's the human beings who speak, isn't it? But in this tale, human uh, animals can speak, think and act like human beings. Now, <laughs> this is also a little bit a uh, misogynistic uh, poem, just because it discusses about the issue of women's counsel, women's listening to, uh, taking women's advice. Okay, maybe you can say that this person is a little bit a male chauvinist, hmm? because critics has uh, unleashed him for speaking against uh, he, uh, women. Okay. In this story, also, he's actually ridiculing women. Okay, he's satirizing women uh, and uh, men who take their advice. Now, uh, it also deals with the significance of dreams, hmm? then uh, themes of flattery and pride. So, story of non priest tale in a nutshell, it is, uh, I'm going to tell you the story in a nut uh, nutshell. So, let me tell you, the story is told by nuns priest. Hmm? Long ago, the, uh, there lived a widow and um, two daughters, hmm? and they were very poor. So they kept some cattle, uh, a hen, I'm sorry, a rooster and seven hen. See, rooster's name is Chanticleer. He was the master of seven hen and uh, seven hens. Okay, but his favorite hen was favorite wife was Lady Wortlot, uh, Okay, she held the heart of Chanticleer. So Chanticleer had a nightmare hmm? and so, so he was groaning. So his wife, Pert Lottie, his favorite wife, asked him why he was very sad. So he to, uh, told her that she, he had a nightmare in which he was caught by a fox. So she became very angry and she uh, she told him that he had lost all her, um, I mean, she had lost all her 
respect for her, her husband. Hmm. Okay, Pertlotti. Pertlotti is the hen. She is the hen and Chandiclair is the rooster. Hmm. Chandiclair has got seven wives. Hmm. He is the master of seven hens. But his favorite wife's name is Pertlotti. So this Chandiclair had a nightmare one night and the next day he was groaning because of that. So when Pertlotti asked, he told the truth that he had a nightmare. He was caught by a fox in his dream. And Pertlotti told uh, him that, see, uh, I had a dream, mm, uh, something bad is going to happen. So Patlodi became very angry. She told her husband that he ha uh, she had lost all her love and respect for husband because she doesn't love a coward. And she told him that you had a bad dream just because you had uh, eaten too much. You better take some laxative. Mm, you'll be okay. You have eaten too much. That is why you, ha you are seeing such kind of dreams. Uh, anyway, uh, Chanticleer says that dreams has got significance. Actually, dreams are giving us some um, what hints about the future. You have to believe in dreams. But uh, 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 I mean, Pertlotli says that dreams are absurd. Hmm? A brave man like you shouldn't believe in dreams. Then Chanticleer tells two stories. Hmm? One story is like this. Hmm? The rooster again telling a story. Let me tell you, uh, Canterbury Tale itself is a story about storytelling. Hmm? Uh, 29, Ch Chaucer is telling us a story. Then Chaucer's characters are telling the story. And their characters are in turn telling a story. It's like a labyrinth. Story about storytelling. Got it. So, yeah. Uh, so the rooster... That rooster is telling a story. Hmm? Two people are going for a pilgrimage. Hmm? And two, uh, uh, two hmm? okay. When the night comes, one pilgrim, hmm? he got a lodge. Hmm? But the other pilgrim, he hasn't got a lodging. So he took shelter in a barn. Hmm? And he was, and the second one who has taken lodge in a, sh a barn, he was looted by the, uh, looted by some thieves. Hmm? And he was murdered. Hmm? And he appears in the dream of the pilgrim that has got, shelter in the lodge and he says that he was murdered and uh, next day you can uh, he, he can see the body of the person in a uh, cart in a cart bis outside the city okay anyway that person at first the, uh, he doesn't believe in the dream but when the next day when he went to the barn and when he inquired uh, about his friend the barn owner says that hmm uh, he um, actually, uh, he, he hasn't seen him in the morning. Then he went in search for his friend outside the barn. Um, and outside the city gate, he has seen the body of his friend as he, seen, as he has seen in his dream. That is the first story told by the Chandi Clare. The next story is, um, uh, I mean, Chandi Clare again says one story. So has to make his belief, uh, make his wife believe that Hmm? Dreams are significant. They are actually giving you some hints about the future or danger that is hidden in the future. That is the second story is some sailors are going for a uh, journey. Hmm? And one of the sailor had a dream that the ship is going to be drowned. Anyway, when he discussed with his friend, they, uh, they uh, satirized him. Okay, they laughed at him. Hmm? But when actually when they, uh, when they reached at the middle of the sea, Hmm? A ship has wrecked and they all drowned. They were drowned to death. So in these two stories, hmm, dreams has actually come true. So what Chanticleer wants his wife to, uh, um, he wants his wife to believe in dreams. Anyway, she was not ready, uh, was not ready to believe in dreams as uh, uh, recommended by her husband. Then next day, after some days, when Chanticleer was alone, Mm, while he was sitting on the branch of a tree, mm, uh, he saw a fox. Mm, fox came and flattered Chandiclear that, uh, see, he hasn't seen such a beautiful uh, rooster mm, uh, in that part of the country. So he asked Chanticleer to sing. Mm. So Chanticleer believed in fox flattery. Mm. He has fallen in fox flattery. He started to sing. Once he started to sing, mm, fox has caught him okay so his dream has come true isn't it in his dream 
he has seen that fox caught him hmm? and that has really happened but our chanticleer is very uh, clever hmm? uh, see fox caught him and he started to uh, run from that place hearing the uh, cry of chanticleer his wives and cattle bees everything started to chase the fox even the widow and her daughter chased the i mean fox okay so uh, seeing all this chanticleer told rooster see entire women are chasing you see after all you are a man why can't you throw some insult at the, those ladies hmm? you are a man right just throw some insult at the, those ladies so uh, fox believed uh, in that and he opened the mouth so as to uh, insult uh, i mean cattle hens lady and their daughters so no sooner did he open his mouth than our chanticleer escaped from his mouth and he uh, flew on the top of a tree and he settles there thereafter uh, what he lives a happy peaceful life that is the story of nun priest tale so let me tell you in this tale uh, he i mean nun's priest hmm, he actually ridicules the entire women race because chanticleer in order to convince convince his wife he calls a latin phrase hmm, that which i will forward in the notes in principio mulier es hominis confusio the meaning of those uh, lines is woman is the man's soul bliss and joy see chanticleer loves his wife very much she also loves him but she is not re ready to believe in the dream that he has seen hmm? so when she uh, when she has gone away from him he decided to convince her that is why he told her woman is the soul bliss of a man woman is the happiness of a man <laughs> actually he misquotes that the exact meaning of that latin phrase is that women is the reason for the downfall of the man you got it women is the reason for the downfall of the man he believed in his wife even though he believed in his own dreams hmm, he was actually he was forced to believe what his wife says has he followed his wife's advice if he has taken his wife's advice and what happened he was caught by a fox isn't it so this is a satire let me tell you nun's priest tale is a satire hmm it discusses about the issue of women's counsel the particular priest says that you, no one should take one's wife's advice if they take that will become the reason for their downfall it also discusses the theme of flattery and pride why see chandiclear was caught by the fox just because he believed hmm, he believed uh, in the flattery of fox fox the fox has flattered Hmm? John declare telling that he has seen seen such a beautiful rooster in that part of the area hmm? so that uh, that made this uh, uh, John declare very happy and uh, he became very uh, what haughty and started to sing isn't it so that is the story of nan priest anyway let me tell you uh, please study hmm? please get the summary of nan priest and uh, please study canterbury tales in prologue to canterbury tales in detail so that's all about the block 1 we have completed block 1 if you have any doubt you can uh, if you have any doubt regarding how to study canterbury tales please uh, uh, feel free to ask me if you want i can forward some more, yeah. uh, one more doubt ma'am when yeah. we write uh, the answers uh, should we mention the annotations uh, in a complete sentence or just we can uh, I put dot dot and we can explain that thing. No 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 no, my dear, your annotation is out of ten marks. So make sure that you write at least two pages. Okay, two or one and a half pages. Okay, two and one and a half page. Three strictly in three paragraphs. Okay, don't write, thank you, thank you. don't write in a clumsy manner. And apart, you should underline your points. Okay. It doesn't it doesn't matter whether you write five pages, ten pages, whatever. Okay, points are of the most important. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay, let me ask you. Let me. I just want some feedback from you. I don't know how far you are able to understand Canterbury Tales. At least, have you got an overview about Canterbury Tales? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for giving such wonderful class.